joyful noise unto the earth, unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and voice of a psalm, with trumpet and sound of cornet. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord the King. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. God is good and all the time. Let's try that again despite the heat. God is good and all the time. Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. There isn't a generation that can tell God we did not have any truth at all. His truth endureth to all generations. Good evening, everybody. How do you do? Nice to see you in the house of God. Well, wherever you are, wherever you're from, nice to see you, Dr. Lynn. Good to see you. Blessings upon you. Have we heard from Brother Zom recently? He's in camp meeting in Zimbabwe. Well, he's a happy man. I'm sure he is. Okay. If you communicate, please give him my regards. Please do that. All right. Hello. How are you? Nice to see you. That's a nice hat. It has flowers growing in it. That's very nice. God bless you. My little brother next to you, or where the little children, okay, my little angel over here. Oh, most of them have gone to um, the adventurers. Yes, well, I miss them. Lovely children. God bless them, protect them. Last night, there was an accident, I was told, today. Remember our sister from Nigeria? Who, um, Sol Sola, yes. And uh, were you with her? Okay. And an animal, a deer, got in your way somehow, and, uh, but the Lord preserved you. You are here. Tell Shola we thank God for watching over her because the devil is a busy man. I mean that genuinely. Never take for granted safe journey. Never, never, never. The devil tries always to take people's lives. And so Jesus said, the thief cometh not, but for the steal to kill and to destroy, and that is a reference to Satan. What did Jesus say? I am come that they might have life. And so the intelligent choice is to put your hands in the hand of Jesus Christ. All right. Welcome to those of you coming in. I have a couple of questions, and I want to get to them. I think they are here. Before I go any further, let me pray and ask God for wisdom. Loving Father in heaven, as I attempt to answer these questions submitted by your people Give me wisdom from above, dear God. Help me only to give, thus saith the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I can't see clearly. Let me put on my eyes. Now it says, if there's a certain truth that one has been enlightened about, but is still struggling or praying about, what should they do in the meantime? In the meantime, you try to in the meantime, try to obey the truth as you know it. Ask God for help. Whenever you learn truth, follow it. Ask God to help you. <clears throat> yes, God knows we're human beings. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 14, for he knoweth our frame. He remembers that we're dust, so we're weak. Uh, we struggle with our faith. But when light comes to you, try to obey it, because if you don't and you delay, ultimately that light will be withdrawn. That's the way God functions. So if you know that you're required to do something, ask God for the strength to do it as soon as possible. Do not delay. Uh, there's another question. A non-Adventist is interested in the Sabbath observance. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, oh, and for some reason, could not prepare for the Sabbath. In other words, cook. What do I eat? <laughs> do I still not cook? Won't I go hungry? Well, yes, you might go hungry for a day, yes. The Bible talks about 
the Sabbath, it talks about preparation day. Preparation day is given to us, which is the day before the Sabbath, which is Friday, the day before the seventh day, to make all necessary preparations for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is such an important day in the eyes of God, it has a day attached to it called preparation day. That's when you cook, that's when you polish your shoe, that's when you do everything necessary so that on the holy day, your time is not consumed doing these little things. Let me say that again. The Bible identifies a preparation day. And that day is to make all the preparations so that when the Sabbath comes, you are ready to observe God's Sabbath. It is a sad fact that many of us do not use the preparation day as we should. And we end up doing on the Sabbath what we should be doing on the preparation day, like ironing our shirts or polishing our shoes. And you may say, well, that's a little thing. Yes, but eating the fruit in the garden was a little thing. It was not murder. It was not genocide. It was a little thing. Why is it? Have you ever heard of Parkinson's disease? Yes. You know what causes that? A malfunction at a microscopic level. I can lose this leg and still be in good health. But if my neurons cease to function, I am in trouble. Are you following me? And I've never seen a neuron with my naked eye. And so little things are important. And so I say to this person, use the preparation day to do everything necessary, including cooking, because we should not cook on the Sabbath. Do I sound as if I'm speaking a foreign language? Let me say it again. Seventh-day Adventists, according to the Bible, should not cook on Sabbath. According to the counsel from uh, Ellen White, you may warm the food, but there's to be no cooking on Sabbath. Let me say something quickly, then I move on from this uncomfortable subject based on the expressions on your faces. The Lord does not bless us the way he should because we do not do what he says. And God cannot bless disobedience. He just does not bless disobedience. Now, there's some general blessings we still get because Matthew 5, 45 says, He maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So we enjoy these general blessings. But to be a recipient of God's choicest blessings, the condition is, give me one word, obedience. Never forget that. All right. And so do what has to be done preparation day. And if you don't, then going hungry on the Sabbath is not so bad. Here's a troublesome question. Well, I won't answer it now. Um, I'll get to these tomorrow. Okay, because it's already a quarter to eight. Our subject for this evening, mind your step. What did I say? Mind your step. When I fly into Schiphol, uh, the major airport in Amsterdam or in uh, Holland, and I take the, what do you call these things in, in the Europe? Like a moving, what do you call it? A traveling what? A travelator. No, we call it a moving sidewalk. So when you, <laughs> when you walk on these things, a voice says, mind your step. When you're coming to the end, mind your step with irritating frequency. Mind your step, mind your step. So our subject for this evening is mind your step. But I have another topic in case you don't like mind your step, and that is on dangerous ground. What did I say? Give me both. Mind your step. Or? On dangerous ground. Now let me ask you what I've asked you before. What is this? What is this? Which one do you think I want you to use? All right, case closed. This is turned off. Oh, no, it's not. Let me do that now. I was in Australia several years ago preaching, and we were in a theater, sloping seats, you know, the pit where the orchestra sits, I think. And this lady was sitting about where you are, and I'm on an elevated stage, and I'm preaching, and her phone rang. Now, I thought she would scramble to turn it off. She answered the phone and chatted right under my nose on the Sabbath. And I know she wasn't talking to Jesus. And she chatted after a while, then she put the phone away, and she resumed her sinless attitude, looking at me as I tried to preach God's word. I couldn't believe it. You know, I was this close to giving her a vegetarian rebuke, but I was restrained by the Spirit of God. But we must, I was talking to my good sister, Sister Helen, where I'm staying. And we were talking about how people behave when they have an audience with the Queen. Are you with me? 
you can't come in the Queen's presence with a skirt all the way up here. You can't do that. You know, uh, whatever else. No, 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 no. You have to dress a certain way. And you don't talk to her first. You wait until she talks to you. And then you talk. I mean, there is rigid protocol. And there is nothing wrong with that. When the judge walks into the courtroom, what do you do? You stand up. And if you don't, you're in trouble. When he or she gets up to leave, what do you do? Stand up. Do you get on your cell phone in front of a judge? No. Do you chat with your friend? No. Do you fix your hair? No. Do you massage your husband's deltoids? No. You sit quietly in the presence of a judge. Now, are we not in the presence of the judge of all the earth? Come on, tell me. Let's show him some respect. He deserves it. Anyway, if you can use a Bible, use it. If you don't have it, okay. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. And say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on what Bible verse? Verse 9, which says what? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Ah, God bless the scholar right up front in red, the blood, the color of Christ's blood. Thank you. Continue to work on it. We have tomorrow and Sabbath for you to get it without making one mistake. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And the favor, number three, I want you to think as you listen. Think. That's based on what Bible verse? Isaiah 1.18, the first part of that says what? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's pray. <coughs> dear God in heaven, thank you for this high honor of speaking for you. Thank you, dear God, for health you've preserved. Thank you for your people who love your word and have come night after night. I thank you, Father, for those who join us via the internet, wherever they are. As we worship you, Father, we do so as one family under your love. Dear God, first of all, cleanse our hearts from sin because sin creates static and makes it difficult to receive transmissions from above. Grant us your Holy Ghost, dear Father. He is the spirit of truth that he may enlighten us and help us to understand spiritual things. As for me, dear God, cleanse me from sin, large and small. Fill me with the spirit. Possess my mind, Father. I offer myself to you as an unresisting instrument. Use me for the proclamation of truth. I humble myself before you, Father. You take the glory and give to us the blessings, I pray. Bless all those who've come. A special blessing on Brother Edison, a guest day, God. Bless that man's life. Bless his family. And reserve a place in your kingdom for him when you come. Bless this country and all countries represented by those listening to this message. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen and amen. <clears throat> What's our subject? Mind your step. We just stick with that one for now. Let us go to Revelation 12. And we'll read from verse 7. Revelation 12, reading from verse 7. Now, remember favor number three, we shall reason as we read God's word. And the Holy Ghost will guide that reasoning. Reasoning is good, but when you come to the Bible, you must reason through the scriptures. Logic is not enough. We need a Holy Ghost. What book did I say? Revelation. What chapter? Twelve. Reading from what verse? Seven. Read with me. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was the place found any more in heaven. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, question for you, how did the devil get sinless angels to follow him in his rebellion against God? And that's for your reflection. How did the devil get sinless angels to follow him in his rebellion against God? Now, let's get a clue from Jesus Christ. John 8, verse 44. This is one of the more embarrassing verses in the Bible. John 8, verse 44. <coughs> 
and they're from the lips of Christ himself. When you found that, say amen. <clears throat> Let's read, Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Keep going. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it now. Let's look at two things. He was a murderer from when? So he's the father of murder. But he's also the father of something else. Lies. For he is a liar and the father of it now. The question becomes, what is a lie? Okay, it's an untruth. Okay, how else can we express that? What is a lie? In order to lie to the angels, what did Lucifer have to do? Well, let's get some clues. Let's go to Genesis 3. Let's get some clues. Genesis 3, I want you to reason to the right conclusion. Genesis 3, we'll read from verse 1. Read with me. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What did he say to the woman? Did God really say? Now, read verse uh, 16 and 17 of chapter 2. You know those passages very well. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so God said clearly, thou shalt not eat of it. The devil comes along and he says, did God really say that? What is he putting into the mind of Eve? Doubt, Doubt about the reliability of God's word. Now go to Matthew chapter 3. You read 16 and 17 of Matthew chapter 3. Our subject, mind your step. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. The Bible says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying unto him, What? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What did that voice say? Come on, tell me, you just read it. This is my... That's the voice. Now, where do you think Satan was when that voice spoke? Right there at the baptism. Now, the devil has many demon angels, but he took care of Christ himself. Are you following me? The devil didn't assign any of the angels to Christ. Christ was his assignment to get Jesus to fall. So we have to believe the devil was present and heard the father say, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now go to chapter 4 of Matthew. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, mind your step or on dangerous ground. Matthew 4 from verse 1. Read with me. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, what? If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. What do you notice that's similar to Genesis 3 verse 1? Doubt. doubt. Now, in order to put doubt, what does he have to attack? Listen to me. In order to put doubt in the mind of an angel or in your mind or mine, what does the devil have to attack? The word of God. The word of God. Whether written or just oral, Satan has to attack the word of God. Now, why is that his primary focus? Here's what Jesus said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And so Satan has to attack what we are required to live by. Are you following me? And so while we do not know exactly what he told the angels in heaven, we have to conclude based on Bible evidence that he questioned the word of God. He put doubt in the minds of the angels regarding the word of God. And he was successful to the extent that one third of all the holy angels followed Lucifer. 
the word of God. Which means that God's greatest enemies have always been those who interfere with his word. Let me say differently. God's greatest enemies have always been religious entities. Let me put it differently. The worst deceptions are not political or economic or whatever else. The worst deceptions are what? Spiritual. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Our subject, mind your step, or on dangerous ground, is five or three minutes to eight. I'll try to release you as soon as I can, not giving any specific time. All right, what book did I say? Genesis, what chapter? One, reading verse 26. Genesis 126. Let's read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Creep reading. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, male and female created he, them and God, blessed them and God, said unto them what? Be fruitful, come on, and multiply, and, and do what? Replenish the earth. Which means what? Go all over the world as you multiply, occupy the whole world. By the way, it was never God's will that people live on top of one another in cities. God put Adam in a garden. Remember that. He put him in a garden. And so God said, replenish the earth. Now let's look at a rebellious group of people, the ones who built the Tower of Babel. Let's go to chapter 11 of the book of Genesis. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, mind your step, and I'm laying a foundation. Genesis 11, reading from verse 1. Have you found that? Yes. Read with me, what does it say? And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there. This is after the flood, you see. The and the, the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they, they started moving, and they went to Shina, which is actually where, uh, another word for Babylon. They found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there. Verse 3, keep reading. And they said, one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Now, they're about to build what? Uh, yes, they're about to build a city. Skip to verse 4, what does that say? And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Now carefully, and let us make us a name, lest we be what? Scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now what was it they did not want to do? They did not want to go all over the world, which was in contradiction to what? God's desire. God said, replenish the whole earth. They said, uh-uh, we want to concentrate. So we're building a city, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, this was opposition to God's word. Now, excavations have uh, produced things called ziggurats, which are like little towers, I guess. At the tops of these towers were, um, were dedicated to gods. That's where worship was held, the tops of these towers, ziggurats. And Bible scholars who studied the origin of uh, um, idol worship, trace it all the way back to Babel. All the way back to Babel, which became Babylon. Now, here again we see God saying one thing and a group saying something else. And so we have opposition to the word of God. Let me say it again. The greatest deceptions are spiritual, not economic, not demographic, not political, not economic. The greatest deceptions are spiritual, which means that a man or a woman has to be very careful where he or she places himself or herself when it comes to church affiliation. You have to choose wisely because the greatest opponents of Christ have always been religious organizations. 
You don't believe me? Let the Bible convince you. In John 18, between 18 and 19, three times, Pilate said something about Jesus. Can you guess what that was? Three times he said, I find no fault in him. That's Pilate, representing Rome. What did the Jewish church say? Crucify him. Now, Pilate, wanting to let Jesus go, he produces, um, what's that fellow's name? Barabbas, yes. So here's Barabbas, here's Jesus. You might as well say, here's God, here's Satan. Are you following me? Pilate says to them, which one do you want? <laughs> they said what? Give us Barabbas. And do what to him? Kill him. The crucified takes too much time. Let's say, kill him. Give us Barabbas and kill God. By the way, the ultimate aim of sin is to kill God. My brothers and sisters, mind your step when it comes to choice of a church. Because according to prophecy, the greatest enemy of truth in these last days is an entity called Babylon. It's an entity called the beast. And I won't go into all the, the details of that, but the Bible prophecy teaches us that the greatest enemy of truth, the greatest enemy of Christ and his plan for the universe is a religious entity called Babylon, a religious entity called the beast. Let's go to John 6. Mind your step is our subject or on dangerous ground. John 6. We read from verse 66, 5 after 8. Do you have John 6? Read with me. From that time, many of disciples did what? Went back and walked no more with him. Because Christ has said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. He had said that earlier in chapter 6. And so they couldn't take it. They began to question does he expect us to eat his flesh and drink his blood? They were thinking cannibalistically. Christ was speaking symbolically, meaning his word. You understand? And so because they were offended by the words of Jesus, they left him. And that's not unusual. People leave the church whenever the sermon is too tough. They may leave that particular service or they may leave the church altogether. Because any time a message cuts across human inclination, we rebel unless we truly surrender to God. And we're truly humble to allow the truth to do its punishing work on us and its life-giving work, by the way. And so they left him. Now read verse 67 for me slowly. What does that verse say? Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Will you also leave me? You know, Peter, John, Andrew, Simon, all these people. Listen to what Peter says in the next verse, 68. Read for me. Then Simon answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Now, Peter is presenting to us the reason to place yourself in a church. That church must preach what? The words of eternal life. There is no life in error. There's life only in truth. I was telling my sister, a preacher who preaches error does not get very tired. <laughs> but when you preach truth, it, it wears you out. It really tires you. Error does not. I'll tell you something else about error. It takes a lot of words to defend error, it takes just a few words to defend the truth. Let me say it again. The truth can be defended in a few words. Error takes a lot of words because you have to engage in circuitous reasoning to arrive at error. Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. What Peter was saying, we are staying with you, not because you have a church building that's attractive. He had none. The foxes have holes, the birds have nests, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. They were just walking from place to place. They stayed with Jesus simply because of what he taught. 
If that's clear, say amen. amen. Now, let's leave that right there. Let's run to the book of Acts chapter 9. Acts 9. We just discovered that religious entities are the greatest enemy of Christ. We discovered that the devil always attacks the word of God. If he doesn't, then he will be unsuccessful. He must attack the word of God. He did that in heaven. He did it in the garden. He did it to Christ. Of course, he failed with Christ, and he must fail with us. Acts 9, reading from verse 1, let me pray before I go any further. Father in heaven, please grant me your spirit. If I said anything I shouldn't have said, forgive me. Take a firmer grip of my faculties, God, and speak literally through me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Acts 9, reading from verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Saul, before he became Paul, persecuted the church that Christ raised up. He would arrest people and agree to have them killed. He never killed them himself, but he consented to their death. So he was equally guilty. Verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Pause. He recognizes who has confronted him in this blinding light on the road to Damascus. And he asks a question, what will thou have me to do? As I told you last night, let me say it again. Any time you listen to God's word, ask yourself, Father, what will you have me to do regarding what I heard? And I'm assuming you'll hear the truth. What should you do if it's not the truth? Ignore it completely. But if it's the truth, surrender yourself to the truth of God's word. And so Saul said, what will thou have me to do? Now, Saul had asked a previous question which was, who art thou, Lord? And what was the answer? Amen. Who art thou? He said, I am Jesus. So Jesus answered his question directly. Are you following me? You sure? His question was, who art thou? Jesus answered directly, I am Jesus. His second question was, what will thou have me to do? Listen to the answer of Christ. Arise Go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Question for you. Did Jesus directly answer his second question? No. Jesus said, you go to the city, and someone will tell you what you need to do. Now, this brings to us a very, very important concept. What Christ is saying, there are some people in Damascus who will speak for me. And what they say, finish my words, you must do, but something else. If they speak for me, it means whatever they say are my words. <laughs> now, question again for you. Could Jesus have told Saul what he needed to do? Yes, he could have given him all the details, but God does not bypass his church. You can't circumvent the church of God and go straight. No, you cannot do that. God has a church on earth that will say what he says. Now, and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, when his eyes, his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Now read with me from verse 10. What does it say? And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Now what do you understand by a disciple? A disciple of whom? Jesus. Mm -hmm. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Now Jesus leaves Saul, after telling him, there's someone in Damascus who will tell you what to do. And then Jesus goes to whom? Ananias in a vision to give Ananias 
the information they gave Saul. Let me tell you something. When the church says, thus saith the Lord, that is the voice of God. Let me say it again. When a church preaches, thus saith the Lord, that is the voice of God. And so Jesus said, Ananias, he said, behold, I am here, Lord. And he said, arise, go into the street, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and have seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Read verse 13 for me. Then Ananias answered and said what? Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Ananias does not want to do it. He had heard about Saul. Saul had a reputation. You know, if, depending on where you come from in the world, you're maybe from a village, there's some man in the village who has a reputation for being crazy. Don't mess with that man. He's a bad John. He's a tough guy. Well, Saul had a reputation. And Ananias, a strong disciple of God, said, no, 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 Father, please don't send me to that man. <laughs> but the Lord said unto him, what? Go thy way. For he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 17, read with me. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hand on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, have sent me, huh? Who sent him? Jesus, that thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now Ananias is telling Saul what Jesus told him. And of course, this story is found three places in the book of Acts, I think chapter 22 and 26, and each one has uh, additional details. But the point I want you to get is that Jesus told Saul, I have a group of people that will tell you what to do, meaning whatever they tell you is from me. My brothers and sisters, there are thousands of churches on the face of the earth. Which one do you follow? Which one speaks for God? It's a question you must ask. Which one speaks for God? We must follow the example of Peter. You must find a church that has the words of life. And the words of life must be, thus saith the Lord. However unpopular that may be. The Bible says, and immediately, verse 18, they fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. Verse 19, and when he had what? Received meat, he was strengthened. Finish that verse. Then was Saul certain days with whom? That's the church. That's the church of Christ. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were where? At Damascus. He was sent to the church. Now, we have to figure out. Was this a Jewish church? Let us go to Galatians and listen to Paul himself. Galatians. Well, before we go to Galatians, go back to verse 1 of Acts 9. Then we'll go to Galatians 1. Our subject, mind your step or on dangerous ground. <laughs> Acts 9, reading from verse 1. The Bible says, now listen very carefully. Read with me and let's read microscopically. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against whom? The disciples of the Lord. Now, for whom was Saul working? The Jewish church. That's why he was going to the high priest to get letters to Damascus in the synagogues. He was working for the Jewish church. Persecuting the church of Christ. So we have two churches in verse 1. One mentioned, one implied. The church that Christ founded and the Jewish church. Now, let's go to Galatians 1. Galatians 1, we read 13 and 14. 
a subject, mind your step or on dangerous ground. Do you have Galatians 1, yes. 13 and 14? Read with me. What does that say? For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. The word conversation there means conduct, lifestyle. Ye have heard of my behavior, my conduct, my conversation. Where? Come on. In the Jews' religion, that's one church. Keep reading. How that beyond measure, come on, I persecuted, come on, the church of? Uh-huh. So what he's saying without realizing it, he's saying the Jewish church was not the church of God. Mm -hmm. He didn't notice what he said, but that's what he's saying. He said, ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. That's what he said. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God. So we have the Jewish religion persecuting the church of God, meaning that the Jewish church then was not the church of God. That's a tough thing to say. But when Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate, that when Stephen was stoned, something ended. And Paul said, I persecuted the church of God. Because what the church of God was preaching was different from what the Jewish church was preaching. The church of God had Christ at the center. The Jewish church had no room in his teachings for Jesus Christ. Even though he walked among them three and a half years in public ministry and 33 as a living human being. My brothers and sisters, we have two churches. The Jewish church, the church of God in Galatians 1.13. In Acts 9.1, we have two churches, the disciples of Christ, and we have, of course, Paul representing the Jewish church. Which leads me to this conclusion, unpopular, distasteful, but let me say it, listen carefully. All churches do not belong to God. Now, all churches have people. Are you following me? Yes. Who have not yet heard the truth. When they hear it, they'll do what? They'll come out. Listen to Jesus. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. What did he mean by this fold? The 12 disciples who were the, 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 the starting point of uh, this new church he was establishing. He said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, meaning they were where? In other folds. Listen to his words. Them also I must bring. Did Christ bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He had to bring them out. To do for them what he wanted to do. He could not do it while they were in Egypt. He had to bring them out. And the same Christ who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. That's the one saying them also I must bring. And how are they brought? They shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold. And one shepherd. All churches do not belong to God. Let me tell you something. The most dangerous place you can be is in the wrong church. Let me put it differently. Other than the crucifixion of Christ, the greatest catastrophe to befall a country, a church, was the destruction of Jerusalem. The Bible itself doesn't have a lot of details. It has some, but not a lot. We have the destruction of Jerusalem in the days of uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and then, of course, in the days of the Romans, hundreds of years later. If you read secular history, the writings of the historian Josephus, the description of conditions in Jerusalem during the Roman siege were horrific. People were eating their children. And of course, that had been predicted for the destruction of Jerusalem. It was predicted, you read Ezekiel, you'll find that in Ezekiel. The fathers shall eat their children, and the children shall eat their fathers. Way back in the days of Moses, there was a, a, a prophecy of terrible times to come. 
based on the rejection of Christ. And this was Jerusalem. It had rejected God and it suffered a terrible destruction. A church. Not a casino or a whorehouse, as bad as they are. A church. Listen to me. The most dangerous place to be with respect to the coming of Christ is the wrong church. Because the greatest opposition to God has always been religious organizations. And it is no different today. The greatest opposition to truth are religious organizations. Go to Acts chapter 4. Let's see that dramatically presented. Acts 4, we'll read from verse 13 our subject, mind your step or on dangerous ground. We're looking again at the Jewish church and the church Christ established. Acts chapter 4, we'll read from verse 13. When you found it, let me know by saying amen. Let me pray again. Father in heaven, I'm coming to the end. Please don't let your spirit's ministry come to an end. Let him continue to look feverishly with me, dear God. I humble myself again. Use me for your glory and for the enlightenment of your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Acts 4, reading from verse 13. Read with me. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, finish that verse, they could say nothing. By the way, you and I must so live our lives that our enemies can say nothing against it. When you go to work, you must conduct yourself in such a way that even though your boss hates you, your boss has to say, you know, I hate that woman, but she's always early. I hate that woman, but she's always well dressed. I hate that man, but his assignments are always well done. You must force it on people. Here is what you say about me. You will say I come to work well dressed. You will say I bring my assignments well done in the classroom. You will say I respect the professor even though you hate me. And so the Bible says beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Read the next verse. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do? to these men for that indeed a notable miracle have been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jer at Jerusalem and we cannot deny it <laughs> listen to me a genuine Christian life cannot be denied even by the devil we cannot deny it ah now this is a church now read verse 17 come on but that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. What are they saying? Do not preach Jesus. Who was saying that? A church. The church was stopping the gospel. Do you know we do that sometimes? Don't preach the Sabbath, you'll bother people. Don't talk about the beast. Because there's a, a convent two miles down the street. Don't talk about vegetarianism. There's a farm of cows right down. Don't do this. Don't do that. Because you'll upset people. Listen to me. To save people, you have to upset them. You take a man from error to truth, you upset him. You introduce a man of the world to the heavenly lifestyle, you upset him. That's why the, the Jews said, these are the men that have turned the world, what? Upside down. They were upset, but they were turning the world right side up. The truth upsets people. And so they said, but that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly, straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Now read verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor in the name of Jesus. Now, here is a church suppressing the truth. Churches do that today. They tell you the law has been done away with. Now, there's no greater truth you can suppress than that. 
Because if there's no law, there is no sin. The devil is so effective. He comes into churches and gets preachers who went to seminaries to get degrees in theology to preach that the law has been done away with. He gets preachers to say, you don't have to obey the law of God. He gets preachers to say, the Sabbath has been changed from the seventh day to the first day. It is religious organizations that constitute the greatest threat to the advancement of truth. And so you have to be careful when you decide, what church will I attend? You must select a church that will present you with, thus saith the Lord. You must select a church that will honor the law of God. You know why? Because the good law of God is the whole duty of man. You must select a church that tells you, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And almost all Christian churches say that. That's nice. You must select a church that says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The church must say that, but many churches have idols right in their buildings and people pray to them. Are you with me? All right. The church must tell you, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Skip to five. The church must say, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The church must say, thou shalt not kill. The church must say, thou shalt not commit adultery. The church must say, thou shalt not steal. The church must say, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. The church must must say, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And the church must say, tell me, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The church must tell you that. Amen. And if you're in a church that does not honor even one of the nine of the ten, you are in the wrong church. i tell you something else about choosing a church. Go to Matthew 28. Let's read from verse 18. Matthew 28, reading from verse 18, we're coming to the end of mind your step or on dangerous ground. On dangerous ground means the most dangerous place you can be is in the wrong church. Matthew 28, reading from verse 18, when you found that, say amen. amen. Read with me. And Jesus came. And speaking to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, carefully, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Stop. Where did Jesus send his people? What is all nations? Give me another word for that. The whole world. The whole world. Which means, when you're choosing a church, you need a church that's found all over the world. Uh, I lost you. You need to say one of the criteria must be this church is found all over the world. Because that's where Christ sent them. Now, I'm not picking on any church, but let me ask you this. Let's say you belong to a church that has a branch in uh, Zimbabwe and a branch in Lesotho, and that's it. Is that in all the world? <laughs> no. <laughs> God bless them, but that's not in all the world. Okay, you have a church that's found all over Europe, and that's it. Mm -mm. It must be found all over the world. Not only does it say, thus said the Lord, the Ten Commandments must be upheld because Christ himself spoke them. It must be found all over the world. Now, let me shorten this. 
uh, for time's sake, there are only two churches that are found all over the world. The Catholic Church and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Of all Christian churches, too. Of all churches that lift up Jesus, too, are found all over the world virtually, the Adventist Church and the Catholic Church. Now, the United Nations recognizes about 232 countries or independent territories. Of that 230-something, the, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in over 200 of them working. Now, that's all over the world. And close to that is the Catholic Church. There are some areas where the only church working is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, am I saying all Seventh-day Adventists are going to heaven? No. What did Jesus say in John 6, 70 about his 12 disciples? Have I not chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. So we have some vegetarian devils in the church. We have some well-dressed demons in the church. We have some tithe-paying fallen spirits in the church. Are you following me? But it does not change the fact that despite the fact that 12 counted one demon, they were still the church of God. Can you say amen? Because the church of God is not God's church because everyone is perfect. It's God's church because it preaches thus saith the Lord. Amen. Not because everyone is sinless. And so we go back to the two churches that are found all over the world. The Adventist church, the Catholic church. Which one will you choose? You'll choose the one that preaches, thus saith the Lord. You cannot choose the one that changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. That's temper with God's law. You cannot choose the one that broke the Tenth Commandment into two. And so having removed Commandment 2, which says don't make idols, then they, were, they had nine left. They had to come up with ten. They broke number ten into two. Let me go over that again. I said that too quickly. The Catholic Church, in its catechism, does not have Commandment 2. Are you listening to me? Now, I'm not picking on anyone. I'm speaking the truth. You get the Catholic Catechism. The most recent edition came out in 1994. Tremendous bestseller. I have a copy at home. It does not have the second commandment. What does the second commandment say? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Now, Idols are prayed to in the Catholic Church and perhaps the Anglican Church because they're so closely related. Yes, you see them. I was a Catholic, and I'm not picking on Catholics. I'm picking on an institution. Are you with me? In the official document of doctrines, the second commandment does not appear. It has been removed. Now, it is found in their Bible because you can't change the Bible that blatantly but the most of the teaching is not from the bible it is from the catechism so here's what we have one church has removed one of god's commandments having removed the second one they realize they have ten, nine commandments now even an atheist knows they're ten so what they did, they took commandment 10, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, thou sh house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, his manservant, maidservant, ox his ass, and they split that commandment into two. So commandment 9 for them says, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, and commandment 10 says, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. But if you do that, you have to keep going. Commandment 11 should be, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's manservant. Commandment 12, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's maidservant. Commandment 13, his ox. Commandment 14, his ass. If you start doing that, you can't stop. And so they've changed God's law, or they tried. And most people follow that change. That's why most people worship on Sunday. <laughs> With no Bible verse. Let me say it again. I hope my internet friends are listening. Most people worship on Sunday without one Bible verse. The greatest opposition to truth are religious organizations. And as you choose, you choose an organization that preaches, thus saith the Lord, even though it is unpopular and leads to loss of job, loss of economic security, and ultimately loss of life. You preach, thus saith the Lord. Amen. And so I recommend to you to take a close look at the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
Is it perfect? No. Does it represent, thus saith the Lord? Yes. Does it uphold the Ten Commandments? Yes. And what are the Ten Commandments according to the Bible? The whole duty of man. Does it recognize Christ? Yes. Does it recognize the state of the dead? Yes. The Catholic Church has something called purgatory. It's not in the Bible. Purgatory is something developed by uh, a Bible scholar called Augustine. He lived from 354 to 430 from North Africa. A brilliant scholar. He's the one who came up with purgatory about three, four hundred years after the, you know, Christ died. Purgatory is not in the Bible, but it's a teaching. The Catholic Church teaches that Mary is a co-redeemer. Are you with me? A co-redeemer. You know what the Bible says? There's none under name under heaven given among men whereby we may be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Not Mary. Mary is dead. She is dirt like my father, dead. That church says you can pray to the saints. Pray to dead people. Pray to dirt. No, no, no. The Bible doesn't say that. That church says if you touch the bones of a dead man, you're blessed. They, 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 they uh, venerate the bones of dead people. That church says a priest can forgive your sins. The Bible says who can forgive sins but God? Because it was Jesus who died, you see. All of these false teaching. The church teaches that you go to hell, you burn forever. The church now has embraced evolution. When you accept evolution, you have to overthrow the creator. Are you with me? No matter how much you say, no, we still believe in Jesus. When you elevate, uh, what's the word, uh, evolution, you demote the creator. That's what the church teaches, among other things. The church teaches that when you take communion, the blood actually becomes what? The, the, not the blood, the wine becomes what? The blood of Jesus. And the Bible says, don't drink blood. Genesis 9 verse 4, God told that to Noah right out of the ark. Leviticus 17 11, because the life is in the blood. But the church says that wine becomes blood. My brothers and sisters, I recommend to you to take a close look at the Seventh-day Adventist church. It can defend its teachings from the Bible. Are we better than anyone else? No. Are we different from? Yes. On any Saturday, wherever you go, but just about the only people worshiping are Seventh-day Adventists. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. And truth is not dependent on popularity. Truth is dependent upon thus saith the Lord. And God said the seventh day is the Sabbath. Not Sunday. Not one second of Sunday is holy. Or Monday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Only the seventh day Sabbath. Which is, now I keep harping on that. Because the church changed God's law, or attempted to change it. When you follow that change, you're following an earthly authority, not a divine authority. Let me say it more embarrassingly. Every church that worships on Sunday is accepting the authority of the Catholic Church. Every church that worships on Sunday is accepting the authority of the Roman Church, not the authority of God. Because God's authoritative word is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it and he gave it to us to keep holy not to make holy to keep holy because what only God can make something holy but he's given us the honor of keeping holy what he has made holy and so he calls us to cooperate with him how many will say father thank you for the truth can I see your right hand stand up with me stand up with me I'm gonna let you go forgive me for delaying you so long. God bless you for staying by. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear God, we thank you for your word. The word is direct. Sometimes the word is painful. Dear God, but so is life-saving surgery. 
Father, medication never tastes pleasant, but it has a good effect. And many times your word is a bitter pill to swallow. But Father, if swallowed, the bitterness turns to sweetness when we realize your word is life. Father in heaven, we thank you for the directness of the gospel. We thank you, dear God, for Christ and for the disciples. We thank you, Lord, there is a people on the face of the earth that upholds your law, which is the standard of righteousness. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, how many of you who are seventy Adventists will say with me, Lord, by the grace of Christ, I will be faithful to the truth. Can I see your right hand? Wherever you are, you are seventy Adventists. Father, by the grace of Christ, I will be faithful to the truth. Just raise your right hand. Father, look at the hands that are raised. Give them strength, they God, to stand for the right, though the heavens fall, as your servant says. Now hands are taken down. Dear God, I make another appeal. Is there someone listening to me? You've not yet made a decision to be baptized. You'd like to make that decision now. Raise your hand where you are. You've not yet made a decision to be baptized. You'd like to make that decision. We have a baptism this Sabbath. Just raise your hand wherever you are. You've not yet made a decision. Or you may need to be rebaptized. Just raise your hand where you are so you can become a member of God's Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church church just raise your hand where you are don't be afraid if you're shy ask us for a card at the end of the service father in heaven again i thank you for the high honor of speaking for you i didn't do a very good job god forgive me for that help me to do better tomorrow father but i hope that my puny human effort will be taken by the holy ghost and will be refined and applied with great force to the minds of those who heard please god awaken those who are asleep help them to understand that the greatest deceptions are spiritual thank Thank you for being so long suffering dear God thank you for waiting and waiting that more may come to the truth and now as we prepare to leave assign an angel to accompany every one of us father because the enemy is busy take us safely to the homes you've given to us as we sleep let that angel stand by our bedside bring us back tomorrow I pray in Jesus name and for his sake let God's people say amen and amen <laughs>